Welcome to this presentation, Introduction to NERSC Resources by Helen Hay. Helen is a high performance computing consultant of the user engagement group at NERSC. She has worked on various systems at NERSC in the past 10 plus years. Helen has also worked on investigating how large scale scientific applications can be run effectively and efficiently on massively parallel supercomputers. Her experience includes, includes the software programming environment, parallel programming paradigms, scientific applications, porting and benchmarking, distributed components, coupling libraries, and climate models. Helen, please. Thanks, Hosni. I am going to share my screen. So welcome everyone. Um, this is part of the summer student intern um, program, CS so yes, um, internship program. And I have been given this talk over the couple of hours, a uh, few years. Um, this year we think about a new idea that besides new students, uh, we also invited a relatively new NERSC users uh, to this uh, short two hours uh, introduction of NERSC resources. Uh, we, usually give um, an annually new user training. And the last one was in June last year. And for this year, we're thinking about, uh, we are, because uh, last year's training, everything is um, online, uh, a whole day of um, more detailed topics than what I'm giving today. Um, so we're giving, a, we will be uh, organizing a new user training um, when core model is in more a state of stable state and when all users have access to it, uh, we have another new user training. First, a few logistics. Uh, we are muted upon joining. If you want, like to change your name, it'll be um, more convenient so we know who you are. Um, the captions is enabled. You can use CC uh, to toggle on and off, and you could also click view, uh, view full transcript. I have uh, opened up a GDoc for Q&A, so it's easier than uh, Zoom chat, uh, inter not interleaving. Also, if there are questions I cannot an, an answer, I can forward on to our other uh, NERSC staff uh, for, with expertise to help answer the, the, G, the question in the GDoc. I uh, will be uh, make slides and videos available and will be posted on training event page as well as, as on the summer, student, uh, summer program page. Uh, one thing um, I did put that into the um, uh, registration form that um, if you don't have a NERSC account set up, or you don't have um, MFA set up to logging, please apply for a training account. Um, if you haven't, you can do it now and because uh, it'll be ineffective in an hour. So when later on when you do hands on, you can use the training account. Okay. I put those uh, information in the chat already. So the topics today will be, you know, NERSC and systems overview, how to connect to NERSC, some file systems, and more on um, software, how to compile and run your jobs, because we will be more uh, doing hands-on and compile running jobs later. And I'm gonna introduce data analytics software services, and I'll, in, I'll tell you all the available resources you can find more information on. So that's the uh, NERSC online resources uh, topic. So first topic, NERSC and systems overview. Uh, you probably, some of you attended this morning's uh, talk, you know that what NERSC is, uh, we're very proud as a flagship for the service uh, science community. We have over 7,000 users and 800 projects serve uh, the basic science research at the DOE multiple uh, DOE multiple program offices. Here is a brief NERSC systems over roadmap. Right now on the system, the main machine is Cori, it's, uh, it's the mini core CPU um, system and um, NERSC 9 Chrome Mother Phase 1 has already arrived. It's our first uh, big computing system with uh, GPU nodes as well. Usually we have every three or four years, we have a new system on the floor and um, have an um, overlap of two systems as well. So today's uh, introduction will be mostly focused on, on the Cori system because for Chrome Mother, uh, users are not on the systems yet. Maybe some of you, uh, some interns have the uh, early access during the summer, but it's no guarantee um, most of people want. So the, today's topic will just cover how to use a uh, query system. 
Korea has a uh, password system, password parts partition and KNL partition. Um, the diff little bit different architectures that uh, one is Xeon and the other one is uh, Xeon Phi with many, many, many cores on a node. Uh, different set of memory and um, first buffer called MCD RAM as well, KNL. It was uh, number five in 26, the highest uh, that we get on the top 500 list. And the most recent top 500 list, Corey is still to number 20 after four years. So we're very proud to have a um, big DOE system and serving our um, so many users for doing scientific research. Uh, Nur, uh, Nurse Kanai uh, is named after Saul Perlmutter. He's actually worked he, a nurse user and also works at the Berkeley lab. He won, won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, um, led the supernova cosmology that um, the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, so the, here, this picture here on, on Muro on the system already shows his research group, the CAC observatory used to uh, for the simulation data for the observation data, and the background is all lots of the uh, simulation results using uh, high performance computers and nurse machines, of course. Uh, just a quick overview on Perlmutter. This is all I'm going to talk about. Perlmutter <laughs> phase one arrived. Uh, 150. Most first phase one is basically um, the uh, GPU partition. Each GPU, each node, GPU node still has a CPU node so that you can do uh, programming offload to the GPU node. Um, we have the file system um, is internal to the to to the compute node, so it's um, a faster I/O, and this interconnect also has a uh, um, improved um, interconnect as compared to the Cori system. So even the phase one itself, it will be two to three times of our Cori system performance. The phase two will come later with all the CPU nodes. Um, the CPU nodes will have about um, the same or, or more than the uh, performance of Cori right now. We will enable users in multiple phases. Um, um, phase one uh, will come up pretty soon or user access. Uh, so this uh, nurse system diagram does not include Perlman on it yet, but uh, if it's there, it'll be in a, you know, another machine uh, parallel to Cori. Then we have um, you know, a different storage system. We have Cori Scratch here um, is external, but the, if there's a, a Perlmutter, then Perlmutter Scratch will be in, uh, it's, uh, it's internal to, uh, to Perlmutter. Whereas Burst Buffer, it's also, um, is first buffer on Cori is actually, we could consider it internal. It's actually adjacent to each of the compute nodes. And we have your you know, home file system. We have a community file system. Uh, I'm gonna tell you which file system is for and mainly for um, in the later slide. We have a long-term storage called HPSS, uh, tape um, storage. Everything is connected with Ethernet and IB um, fabric. Uh, with outside world. ESNet is the backbone of the majority of uh, large uh, facilities uh, across the US and Europe. Uh, we have data transfer node, especially for you to use uh, to uh, do highly tuned for, for uh, transfer uh, your files um, in and out of, of NERSC. We have a Spring server, we have science gateways. I'll talk about these a little bit later. So first, um, connecting to NERSC. So we use MFA, which means multi-factor authentication. So you, when you log in, you have to do NERSC password plus OTP, one-time password. And you can set this up using some uh, Google Authenticator app or um, um, on, on your smartphone, or if you don't have a smartphone, you can also use uh, Aussie on desktop. And then every time you need to log in, you need to uh, find the, the one-time password. So uh, it's used everywhere, NERSC systems, websites, services, everything. Um, so it's kind of inconvenient. So we have an SSH proxy. Uh, so it gives you a 24 hour uh, time period that it only asks you once every 24 hours. You need, so you could set this up. Um, uh, we don't you know, uh, ship to you a, a token or anything, um, but we also don't just use plain passwords. So to, with increased, uh, we need uh, increased security. Uh, nowadays. Just a quick example, uh, you do use SSH and your username here is Elvis. 
query.notes.gov and you get on, logged on to one of the login nodes. So here you was in, in one line, you type your password plus your one-time uh, password OTP. Uh, if you want to do um, SH forwarding, like graphic GUI things, for example, MATLAB here, um, add dash capital Y to it. Um, example here to access a uh, website, my.nurse.gov, um, and allow, ask you to log in, and you would put MFA token or OTP in a separate line here. Um, we would recommend to use uh, one thing called NX, which is uh, also named as known machine. Uh, what is this is, it's a tool for accelerated X. So um, it's much faster, especially if you're not local to the nurse, nurse systems, you're far away um, on the East Coast. Uh, uh, with NX, you basically, this would, you feel almost no delay in your everything GUI setup. It also has an extra benefit that terminal sessions can survive with between um, internet connections. So if you reconnect uh, and close it, come back later, it will be where you left it off. So you need to set this up, um, you need to install a client software on your local system. And here's some, um, um, I try to put the link every, um, on the pages that you need to uh, get more information on. There's another thing called, uh, this is a one sample, uh, no machine setup. When you're logging, you have uh, access uh, create some terminal, and then once in, you're in there, you have your know, terminal open up. For example, here, you don't need to uh, SS-Y or anything, you module load MATLAB, and just uh, type uh, your MATLAB, and then the MATLAB will open up almost instantly. And you could do anything else uh, without GUI, you just you treat it as a normal terminal window as well. Um, there's another way people using um, Jupyter to access. Uh, in, inside Jupyter, there's a kernel called terminal and, and there uh, you access Jup Jupyter with HTTPS as a website, jupyter.nurse.gov. And here you also log in, you know, username, password and OTP, sign in. And then if you choose a terminal as your kernel, then you have a terminal right here. You could do almost everything you have on the terminal as well. Okay, so these are how to access NERSC. Um, are there any questions? Are there anything in chat? Not in chat. I uh, encourage you to use the Google Doc so you can type anything um, uh, real time. I, I'm monitoring um, the G Doc. Um, so I see no questions yet. So I'm going to go on with file systems. So here uh, in the, uh, we have multiple file systems here. Um, the, with capaci capacity increasing, then performance will be decreasing or vice versa. Um, so mostly, um, I don't need to read all, all through. We have a home, we have a, we have a common, we have a community, a scratch, et cetera. So what I'm gonna tell you as a, a commonly accessed file system and what they use, what that they are for. So you log in, you get onto your global home storage. It's permanent and very uh, limited storage, um, but we don't purge them. And <clears throat> it's perfect for storing data as your, such as your source code and shell scripts. Uh, we recommend not to run out of this uh, global home because uh, IO is not tuned for running large parallel jobs. We have a community file system. It's mostly for collaboration uh, between um, between among um, your uh, project members. So each project, research project has a, uh, a directory set up in the community file system and permission is set up uh, with group um, permission um, by default. So uh, it's perfect for sharing data, as I said. Scratch, um, it's large and temporary. Um, it's, very, it's highly tuned for read and write operations. It's a lust of file system and different from the previous two, which are a GPFS called Global Parallel File System. But Scratch is not packed, backed up. It is also purged every, um, for uh, if your files are not accessed for 12 weeks, um, files may be purged. It is perfect for stating your data and for doing computations. Worst buffer is uh, another file system load next to your uh, query compute nodes. This is much higher performance than the Scratch. So it's, it's, also, it, it's the best for getting good performance in those high IO um, dependent codes. 
um, HPSS is long-term storage. I use HSI, H HTAR to put individual files or tar up your files into the uh, tape system. So the files, um, uh, so especially if you're, file, for example, your, your files on a luster scratch file system and you want the, to preserve them and uh, the other file system are too small, HPSS is the uh, best place so you can have a long-term storage. We never purged anything from early days because uh, every, no, no, the, the files are big now and a five, a say five years later is not considered that big. So it's only a small fraction. So we always carry on whatever users putting uh, into the HPSS. So this is, um, before I go on with the next section, I like to just check the Q&A in uh, Google Doc. So, okay. The question is, when will we get our nurse training username account details? I had applied for the account on June 1st. So if you apply for a training account with that link and the code, the four letter code, you should get your training account immediately. Uh, it'll print on your screen. It'll, it'll just uh, um, show up on your screen with the training account account name, it was, which is train and three digits like train 502. And then the password are four uh, long strings, four long phrase, four phrases uh, connected with a dash. So you should write this down because it won't appear for you uh, once you close it. You won't, you can't retrieve it. With that account, um, usually after one hour, I apply within an hour, you apply for the this training account, you will be able to use it um, to access query system and run jobs on it. So if you don't have it, uh, I would suggest you try it again right now. And you can, it's okay, you can just get another training account. Um, another question, do we need OTP every time to use Jupyter Notebooks? I have already, I already have the 24 hour logging token with no machine set up. And I was wondering if something similar could be done with Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Notebooks could be opened from the ter query terminal. So uh, the 24 hour SS with SSH proxy works um, within NERSC, um, uh, how do we say, the framework. So if you set it up, uh, then you, as SH2 query, you log into any of the NERSC websites, it's gonna be valid for 24 hours. And you do not open a Jupyter notebook from query terminal, uh, as far as I know, I may be wrong, but just open it up uh, with a web browser. That's the easiest way. So next question, can we run Jupyter notebooks on GPU? I do not have the option to select a shared GPU node access. Yes, you can run GP, uh, Jupyter Notebook on Query GPU, but you need to have uh, need to have access on Query GPU first. Um, the, some of the NISAP teams already have it. Other people, uh, if you want to use GPU, there's a, a request form in our help portal. You can just uh, send a request in, and uh, if we get approved, you will have access um, with uh, Jupyter using Query GPU. You'll see that button um, appear. Um, with Jupyter. Okay, another question. How about when would the hands-on component presentation be today? Can we use Jupyter to participate today? So I'm thinking about last half an hour to do the um, hands-on and uh, I didn't set up with Jupyter unless you use it as a terminal. Otherwise uh, um, the batch system um, interaction is not available in the Jupyter setup. But inside a terminal, you would do whatever thing as if you are with SSH terminal, so you can do that as well. Um, so I think I answered everything on the GDoc right now. I am going to go on with the next section, uh, software environment and building applications. So on Cori, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a using version of Linux. We have compilers available. I'll just tell you what a software available first. Lots of libraries provided by vendor and lots of them provided by NERSC as well. We have some pre-built um, binaries. We call them application, especially chemistry and material science packages. You can just uh, module load that pack package and then run it without building it by yourself. We also have more libraries uh, in the DOE um, extra scale scientific software stack called E4S has more libraries um, uh, available for you to use. It's portable among, um, between 
multiple DOE labs um, for, um, for this project. Um, it's under the uh, DOE ECP project, Accessible Computing Program project managed by DOE. So we use something called modules environment. Um, everything library use is uh, you, you access them with, with module. Some of the uh, um, useful commands are module avail, module list. Module avail, you can find all the available packages and list would show whatever is loaded right now. And you can use module what is to see what it is. You can swap two different modules. There's also a module help um, to see what it is about each one. So I'm not, uh, there's a link you can have more information about modules. Here is uh, what is loaded on query when you're logging. You, you log in and you do a module list. You see a bunch of these things. Many of them you probably don't care. They are lower level um, um, file software that needed to compile and link. But what you care are usually you know a compiler, a um, a create lib site which is uh, scientific libraries loaded for you by default with um, LA pack. Um, uh, um, some some basic math libraries there, scalar pack. And this is a, a thing called programming environment Intel is what create packages so that it um, loads the compiler, loads the libraries, et cetera, and even um, the um, MPI, create and pitch is an MPI library. And it also uh, defines what is the um, default um, architecture. Um, default architecture on query is Haswell. So there's a query Haswell there. And if you wanna do something, you know, I, I wanna not use the Intel compiler. On uh, query, we also have, uh, a uh, create compiler. So you would, when you do module swap prgenv dash intel to uh, prgenv dash create, and you would get all these um, other things loaded, uh, swapped for you as well. The intel compiler will disappear, the create compiler will show up. So these are the basic things that you need to, to know about. Um, we use cross compile because we actually compile on the has one node for the binary to run on the Cori KNL node. So we, we build on Cori Haswell with some special flags or other special modules that points to KNL as your target, then your binary is built to run on KNL. We suggest to you do build, build binaries for each different architecture because um, a, they are more tuned to run on each um, node, especially KNL has a wider vector length. Um, so you want to utilize those for your performance. Um, the binary built for Haswell do run on KNL, it's just not optimized for it, but not vice versa, because some of the architecture, um, <clears throat> the uh, internal intrinsic functions do not um, exist on the Haswell compute node. Right, so as I mentioned, we have three different compilers available. And um, on query, because of all these PRGENV, all these uh, special more crazy stuff. You can just build your application, whatever the compiler is, just use a wrapper to build your code. You would FTN your Fortran code, CC your C code, and capital CC for C++ code. This will link for you that automatically the uh, mass libraries, the MPI libraries, you do not need to worry about anything. Even if it's if it's Cray provided other libraries such as Cray and NetCDF, Cray HDF, if you load, uh, create a FGF by module, then the wrapper will recognize those as well without you need, your need to add explicitly those where are those libraries. Okay, so that's why we recommend not to use native compilers that's I4, MPI, ICC, etc. Those wrappers can build for serial code and for MPI code because it knows where are the MPI libraries. Okay, and um, when you build for for KNL, um, you remember I told you the CRAP has was the default. What you need to do is swap this module, CRAP has what, to CRAP mic uh, KNL. Then it'll know I'm now building a binary to target the KNL nodes. Um, so to use default Intel compiler, you do nothing. And if you want to swap to, uh, to use CRAP compiler instead, all you need to do is just swap this PRGENV module and then you build it as usual, FTN or CC. For the KNL, uh, already did that. And for KNL using Cray compiler, you would do 
both of these modules swap and then the build your code as usual. Uh, so I did compile uh, question uh, section. Are there any questions about compilation? Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, can we hear more about the compilation differences between the logging nodes and compute nodes? What are the good tips to ensure compatibility across nodes? Uh, I think I, ah, uh, logging, yeah. So on the compute nodes, uh, of course you can build whatever without, um, it's already, for example, the architecture for the compute nodes already defined correctly. And you would still use the wrappers and everything, except um, build on KNL node is, is really slow because the KNL um, CPU speed is much slower than on the logging node. So we do recommend you to build on the logging nodes for um, KNL even. And you can just use the architecture target um, settings and the modules for KNL architecture. So you can build for KNL. Uh, can we have a copy of slides from today? Yes, I'm gonna post it after my talk. It will be on the website and the videos need a little bit pre -pro uh, post-processing. It will be available as well. Um, running jobs. So the jobs and nurse, uh, it's a parallel system. Uh, high-performance computing system that it's uh, 7,000 users. So we use a batch system called Slurm. It's not a simple um, first in, first out. Of, uh, there are lots of uh, scheduling algorithms and to, to make sure this is fair to people. The different, um, we call it quality of service with different um, building priority. We have um, controls with how many jobs per user are considered. So if a user submit 10,000 jobs, um, and then another user company submit one job, it won't have to wait until all the 10,000 jobs from the first user to finish uh, before your job will be considered. Okay, so um, as I said, we have different types of logging the compute nodes. Logging nodes, you would edit your file, commit, uh, compile some scripts and you submit your batch script. You can run very short serial utilities and uh, applications, but for everything uh, using more CPU, more memory, uh, you should do uh, get a dedicated uh, allocation to your job and run on a compute node. So this is a diagram. Uh, on the logging node, you prepare a script and would we'll dispatch to it. What it does, it would get onto a head node of the compute node. So you ask for say with 10 nodes, it'll get onto one node, which is the head node. And uh, inside it, uh, with, within your batch script, now you're on head node. Everything you do like LS, CD, you're, uh, you're running on this head node. Then in order to run parallel jobs, you would issue a command called S1 with more um, uh, specifics, how many tasks, how many threads, et cetera and um, provide your um, application name and input. Then uh, your, your application will be distributed, allocated to run the, the multiple nodes that your job is allocated for. So I'm gonna show you a hello world uh, program example. So this is the batch script you should uh, prepare um, on the logging node. You would give a shell and, and the default shell is bash. You would ask for uh, what uh, we, we call it QoS, which QoS you want to submit to. There are debug, regular, premium, et cetera. And this example, I submit to the debug. And here I ask how many nodes of compute nodes. I'm asking for two nodes. And for 10 minutes, I'm having, um, I'm asking for um, Haswell architecture. So we dash capital C Haswell. And here are two of the things more are optional. One is that give the name of my job, uh, of this uh, job I'm gonna submit so I, I can identify it in the queue script, uh, monitoring display. And here also have a dash capital L, meaning uh, my job depends on the scratch file system. With this, it, it helps you prevent your job from um, crashing when we notice there's a scratch file system. When that happens, we will hold every job that was this dash L scratch in the batch script. And with that script in, you would say as batch my script. So this is uh, inside in a batch queue. And then you just do uh, your things and um, wait. Um, the, when the job finishes, you go in and check um, your output in the 
output directory. Usually it's the where you submit your jobs from. Sometimes you can also specify where your output can be in a different directory. So you submit and you just forget and come back to later check. There's another way to run, it's called interactive batch. So instead of S batch, you would submit with S alloc and do similar things, two nodes, and now you submit to an interactive QoS. With, uh, with that, we have uh, some reserved nodes, so you get your prompt faster. And again, you ask for a Haswell node and ask for 10 minutes. With the Dash Q interactive, what we have set up is you have, you either you get something back within six, six minutes or as alloc would fail. So within six minutes, you get your nodes here, and then you are on a compute head node. Then you could do your SRON, you could do prepare, copy, um, whatever things, um, and then do the parallel run using SRON on, on the compute nodes um, inside this interactive batch session. I'm gonna hold the question in GDoc a little bit and talk about some uh, sample scripts first. So, um, some of you may not know MPI, OpenMP this much yet, but I think our relatively new, uh, new NERSC users, even they're new to NERSC users, they might uh, be very uh, uh, knowledgeable of parallel computing. But I, so I'm gonna show the scripts here because most jobs here at NERSC are parallel jobs. Um, later I'm gonna show if you have lots of serial jobs, what do we do? But for parallel jobs, um, what you usually ask for is many nodes, and then you would run um, something called MPI, pure MPI, or something called MPI, hybrid MPI, and open MP. Uh, MPI meaning you would distribute your uh, job application onto different tasks. This different task can be on the same compute node or across uh, multiple compute nodes. Uh, open MP is usually on, you run it on top of MPI, and you would assign multiple threads for each MPI task to do more parallel uh, work. Um, so, so next Friday, there's uh, another uh, class offered for uh, the computer uh, summer program, um, um, which is called Crash Course uh, in Supercomputing. Uh, you, it, it's an all day uh, class. We'll introduce MPI and OpenMP to you. But right now, just assume you kind of know it, just yeah, we're not talking about details, we're just talking about how to run these jobs. So in this example, it's an MPI job. Um, and here we actually use many nodes. And then these flags already talk about it. And the S run command here, only thing I wanna uh, emphasize is the dash little n, dash c, dash cpu bind what they are. So here, um, this, this means how many total MPI tasks your job will use. And in this example, if you have 40 total nodes, you're basically running 32 MPI tasks per node in this example. Um, and then on this Haswell node, um, I'm gonna show you a little bit later. Haswell node, there are actually 64 CPUs that Slurm thinks they are. So with that, you would um, 64 divide by 32 tasks per node, you would put two here for the dash C. And this is, so this is uh, the, something called affinity. I'll show you how they are, why they are so important. Uh, then the CPU bind equals cores is always needed for um, a parallel job. So that's the pure MPI job script looks like. Now you have a hybrid MPI and open MP uh, script, very similar to those except you would set how many number of thread, uh, open MP num threads per MPI task. Uh, in the example, you set it to eight, and there are a few um, portable open MP standard settings. How do you want your threads to be where they are? Um, we mostly use uh, these, sometimes use, we use equal spread um, for different compilers, and that's it. So with that, um, in this example, look at here, little n 160, meaning 160 total MPI tasks um, to 40 nodes. Then we're doing four MPI tasks per node. And, and on Haswell, uh, we have 64 total CPUs divided by four MPI tasks per node. You would put dash C16 here. So this is the uh, basic examples of using those. So I mentioned we want to um, worry about process 
affinity, thread affinity, memory affinity. So what they are, thread process affinity, meaning you want to bind your tasks, MPI tasks to CPUs. And the thread affinity, meaning you want to bind threads to the CPUs. So I said, um, if we have OpenMP threads on top of MPI tasks, those threads, we want to bind those CPUs to the, um, the parent MPI tasks of these uh, OpenMP threads. And memory affinity is also about um, there are different distances um, of the CPU cores to where their memories are. We want each CPU to access memories local to it. Um, on Haswell node, there are actually two sockets and there are two different uh, NUMA domains. So the distance is different. So these are things we worry about. But once you have that C um, set up with CPU bind cores set up, you are good. But without it, it's, it could hurt performance really badly because otherwise you would probably land on multiple MPI tasks on the same core while wasting other cores are idle. So you're overusing some cores and, and wasting other cores or you, or, or you could be using half of the node memory. So we always uh, recommend you check those and the base quickest way to set C is by how many uh, CPUs per node divided by how many uh, MPI tasks you have on the node. Um, for the Haswell nodes, total is 64 divided by how many MPI tasks per node. On the KNL node, uh, it's more. So I'm gonna show you a little diagram here. With Haswell nodes, uh, we know of that is it has, um, we call it two sockets. So the socket zero and socket one. And on socket zero, there are 16 cores, numbers from zero to 15. Uh, these are the physical core numbers. And you notice there are some green numbers here. Um, we call them logical core numbers. So core zero and 32 is actually one physical core with uh, uh, two logical cores in it. Um, and the numbers uh, that CPU, that Slurm knows about is zero and 32. So if you see uh, zero and 32, say uh, this thread is running on um, core zero and 32, meaning that thread is running on this core. And uh, so the numbers I want, uh, you can't remember it, that's fine. But for the exercises, um, one of the more advanced exercises were doing affinity settings, uh, these numbers would be meaningful. And on Haswell node, another socket, you have physical cores numbered from 16 to 31, and it's corresponding uh, logical cores numbered from 48 to 63. As I, as I mentioned, so cores here access memory local to this part is local, but if course here has to access memory from those DDRs, then it's, it's um, remote, which the remote access uh, for the memory access is lower. Um, so for KNL, um, everything is within one NUMA domain, we call it, and there's no uh, slower or faster uh, NUMA domain access. But on the other hand, um, on, core, on Cori KNL, we have a total of 68 physical cores. They are numbered as zero to 68. And then on um, each core, there are four hyperthreads versus two on Haswell. So once there are four, those numbers are zero, 68, 136, 204. These four numbers that Slurm knows of actually all are on the same physical core zero. And another example here would be, you know, cores, so the logical core or CPUs uh, ID 33, 101, 169, 37, uh, all on the same physical core of 33. So it's 68, and we know a total of 68 times four is 272 CPUs. Um, a a KNL script example here. Um, in this example, uh, we have two nodes and uh, 128 total MPI tasks which means 64 MPI tasks per node. If this is divide, try, uh, we use a total of 272 CPUs divided by that, it's not divisible. So the way we do it on KNL is we usually on purposely waste the four cores. We just use a total of 64 cores on the KNL node. And on those 64 cores, each has four hyper threads so we have a total of 256 CPUs. Now we use that 256 to divide by, um, here in this example, it's 64 MPI tasks per node. I think it's typo here. 
sorry. Um, so this, sorry. So we have 64 total C, uh, tasks on the, um, in this example, and then we would dash C uh, four because it's 256 divided by 64. So once you set this is correctly, your, uh, your um, affinity thing is lined up nicely. So, so this is uh, more of the high, uh, more on these uh, payroll jobs, how they're on the, so just switching gear a little bit to if you have lots of zero jobs, what you do. So we do have a QoS called shared. On this, we allow users to, multiple users to share the same node. And, um, and one good thing is also, you're only gonna be charged for a fraction of the nodes. And it's available on Haswell. You, since your job is serial, you do not use as well. You just run my code.executable and then you would um, go request on the uh, shared node. So this is a sample batch script here. So I already mentioned um, the interactive batch as alloc. Uh, you could do batch queue interactive. Um, a maximum hours, four hours, 64 nodes total only. There's also another thing called a debug, which gives you much more uh, nodes. However, uh, it's up to 30 minutes. So you can choose either one. Um, for the interactive, it gives you six minutes or not, it, or um, a board if you're not getting notes within six minutes. For the um, debug, you will just wait, wait and wait until you get notes. <laughs> we do have reservations um, set aside for the debug. Uh, so it's relatively quick because of its short turnaround time as well. Um, some more advanced running jobs options. You could bundle your jobs. You could have some job dependencies like you wander around one job after the another. Um, there's uh, workflow tools to manage jobs and you, there's something called variable jobs. And if you want really long jobs, you could um, just divide up your jobs into sec um, the multiple jobs and use checkpoint features. Uh, burst buffer could be run using much faster and there's also uh, shifter jobs that um, I'll, I'll talk about first uh, shifter um, in the next section inside the data analytics tools part. There are some other things um, I'm gonna skip, um, but uh, just many options. So bundle jobs quickly, uh, if you want to do multiple SRs, you can do it within one batch script. All you need to do is ask for large number of nodes needed because it's run by, uh, they are run sequentially. So for example, the B dot out is fewer nodes, doesn't matter, you ask for the, total, the biggest um, uh, nodes needed for each of them. Another way to run is you want actually run these three jobs simultaneously, you can do that as well. All you need to do is put an N percent and a wait in the batch script. Now you ask for the <coughs> whichever runs longest. A time for your time, but the number of nodes you ask for the total number of nodes in your script. Sequentially here, you ask the largest number of nodes, but you ask for total runtime, sequential runtime, one A plus B plus C on runtime in the, the script for sequential. Dependency jobs, um, you submit a job, you record its Q, um, job ID, then you, when you submit your second job, you would put uh, some dependency flag here. So after okay means only after the first job is okay, you'll start your second job. There's a, a more a convenient thing called job arrays. Uh, once you do that, you say array equals one to 10, it'll uh, submit 10 jobs. And then each job has a ID for it, which is learn array job ID. And with that job ID in hand, you can manipulate your uh, input and, and output um, directories, file names, etc. So you're submitting one job instead of 10. Uh, but inside, once they're in the batch scheduler in the queue, they're treated as 10 individual jobs. So each of them may start at different time. And also you're subject to per user how many jobs being considered. So sometimes it's not a very good idea. Uh, so workflow here. If you wanna do this, I equals one to 10,000 as wrong, please don't do that because with that, you're, you're issuing an SRAM command like every 
you're issuing say 100,000 per second or even more. So it overwhelms the storm scheduler and other users trying to submit or um, view monitoring the queue, the, the storm would be um, um, responsive. So to do this type of things, we provide workflow tools. There's many of them and you can find the documentation. So one quick example is um, something called GNU Parallel. You would uh, module load Parallel and then um, just use a Parallel uh, keyword. And in here, you would say a Parallel keyword is gonna echo hello world. And with, with parentheses here, this parentheses will be using your input se sequential um, one to five, it'll replace it. And it'll actually issue five jobs. Each of them would do hello world, you know, my, my first job, hello world, my second job here. This is your output. The jobs actually, um, you, you're submitting on the login, uh, but uh, with this parallel, you're actually submitting onto a compute node. They run it sequentially. So the, with that, there's no risk of storm overhead because the GNU parallel workflow is handling that for you. Um, yeah. So this is just one example and look over the um, documentation, the workflows, choose what, what, which, one, uh, which one fits the best for your need. So we do provide a JavaScript generator. It's mostly for the MPI and OpenMP um, type of uh, work. And so you go to my.nurse.gov and there's a job script generator right here. It would give a name, how many, uh, Work, uh, work clock time and you scroll down and asks you what uh, uh, queue you want to submit to, how many nodes, how many MPI tasks, uh, open MP threads, etc. With that, uh, it gives you a script and you can add in more things like if I want to use Scratch file system, I want to give my job a name, if I want to email my job whenever it starts, begins and ends, you can add all these things. Um, you can CD to wherever the actual executable is, so we, you, this is just a, a beginning template of script, but it's uh, pretty convenient for you. For monitoring your jobs, um, there are lots of commands uh, in the queue. Once job in the queue, you can do SQ, and uh, we do recommend SQS, which is nurse custom wrapper scripts. It's all uh, formatted, and also there's a, flat, uh, a column called start time. If the start slum has already an estimate, it'll show, um, of course, this is all flexible because there are more jobs coming in, more jobs finish before they uh, ask the hours they ask it for. So, um, but let's give you a, a quick idea of how many jobs are sitting in the queue. Um, of course, the priority is a combination of which queue and your, the job size and what time uh, request, et cetera. There are many other ways on, in the, um, on the web. My.nurse.gov is a hub for your nurse uh, need. Um, there are users live status in the queue look. There's also in the uh, iris. I'm gonna show you uh, in the resource section what these, sec with what these pages are, but there are multiple places to check your jobs as well. These are the queue policies and Haswell and Kena have one page each. This is just to show you there are many, many different things you can consider, like which QRS to submit to and it tells you what are the maximum size and maximum wall time you can use each uh, QRS for. And then there's also a charge factor. So regular and everything mostly is one, premium is two. Two to four means once you're over some limit of your project, it's gonna be not two X, it'll be four X of a regular jobs charge. And the flex is half. And there's some things called logging, meaning uh, these QoS actually, you're not running on the regular compute nodes of Cori. They're running on a, another server, which is actually, um, you do queue up your jobs, but they're running on a, type of logging nodes for the transfer uh, and compile queue, et cetera. Similarly, uh, for KNL, um, there are fewer QoS available. And uh, yeah, and then the charge factor um, for Corey is 80 and Haswell is 40, uh, is, is 140 for a regular job. So KNL is relatively cheaper because uh, we do have a large, much larger fraction of KNL nodes than on Haswell nodes. So we would encourage users to run more on KNL so that the wait time on Haswell is not unbearable very long. So try to balance that. Very quick few tips uh, some, to get better throughput is submit shorter jobs so that your jobs will be eligible for backfill opportunities. What that means is that Slurm scheduling jobs um, 
allocating nodes for the next big job has, um, and, uh, has to gradually grab nodes when those nodes are free from running jobs. So while waiting for that next highest job, uh, big job to run, sometimes it could backfill some smaller jobs. If they're short, if they are small, and so those jobs are backfill jobs. So if you have your job is small and short, you are more eligible for these to happen. And make sure your job, your request, whatever you need, don't just ask for the default maximum work clock time that is allowed in our queue configuration. Those jobs never have a chance for backfill because you ask for maximum hours of runtime. We have some statistics on old backlog and queue times. It's, it's the historic data, but it's a statistical data as well. You can check it out. If you're running very large jobs, um, there's a, a few things to consider. One thing is do you want, we would like you to SB cast your um, executable to a temp, uh, storage temp memory on the compute nodes. So that'll save up your um, job startup time significantly. So you do that SB cast before you SRAM. Now you use SRAM the, um, the temp file name because you are already, the executable um, name is changed. Other things to consider is if um, you could do build statistically, statically, so that lookup time for dynamic libraries is, is um, saved. For do the two, and you could do a shifter and burst buffer. I'm gonna uh, talk about this a little bit later. Why shifter is also useful for running uh, large jobs using shared libraries. Uh, we want to mention, just mention one more thing on strongly discouraged to run jobs from global homes. Uh, it could call, it's much slower. It causes impact, negative impact if your jobs are uh, using um, um, <clears throat> large IO on global home system, for example. So um, another thing is um, each project has a place called global common software slash your project account. And uh, if you put your software there, they are mounted read only on compute nodes. So it'll be faster uh, with, when you're accessing these uh, libraries. So that's about running jobs. I talk pretty fast, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so I'm trying to squeeze in um, a day's things into two hours or maybe just one and a half hours here. Uh, so we also have uh, hands-on time. Let me go through more of Q&A and then GDoc. Okay, there's one more question. Is there a way to determine the memory requirement of jobs on NERSC so we could ask for the appropriate amount of resources for a job? So there are a few um, tools you could um, check the memory usage. Um, one way is there's an S account um, flat, uh, tool from Slurm. Uh, you run, uh, maybe you run a sample job, smaller job, and the S account, uh, one of the flags to show um, raw memory usage. So with that, you have some information. And um, for batch scripts, I mean, if you request for um, exclusive node, you always get the whole node memory to yourself. If you're running on a shared QoS, um, by default, you get one core of that uh, node, but if your job needs more memory, uh, there's a flag called a dash dash mem equals whatever number is corresponding. You know, you will get corresponding number of cores uh, inside this shared uh, Q, QoS and on the shared node. Uh, besides those um, regular uh, compute nodes, we also have um, some large memory nodes. Um, if I show you this, you notice um, one thing here is called a big mem. So it's, it's, it has bigger memory than the regular compute nodes. Um, so you could use that QoS and also ask for it's on uh, the memory on those nodes are also shared. So you would ask for uh, with dash dash mem equals how much so you get a, a fraction of those nodes. Besides those things, we also have another thing called Cori large memory. Uh, not, not, yeah, so those are another set of compute nodes with bigger memory. Uh, users don't have access to that automatically. Uh, we had this mostly for uh, Cori, uh, no, for, uh, for uh, coronavirus research um, as part of the initiatives of providing uh, computing resources to the, to the world. 
Um, but um, if there are need, um, you can also apply for a large memory node access. Uh, we have the form in our help portal for that as well. Okay. If um, the question, if any of the question I answered don't, is not clear to you, you can comment um, and I'll come back to you. So I think we're gonna go on with the next section, data analytics software and services. So this is what's Corey's friendly features. With Corey, we uh, also we achieved to provide uh, high performance simulation uh, plus high performance uh, data. Um, we call the Haswell partition as our data partition because it has lots of friendly features as I showed you in the queue configuration. Some of the things they are uh, unique to Haswell only like real-time queues, uh, serial, shared queues, interact, uh, interactive is not. Some of them um, are um, on both Haswell and KNL, but they, we do have, um, and basically we, uh, the Cori system is also very data friendly. Um, here listed a few things here. Uh, I talked about create a uh, burst buffer. Uh, much the shared uh, real-time queues is also uh, for request only, then we actually set aside some nodes so that the research team that really need real-time data processing could do uh, their uh, work then with follow-up uh, design for more experiments. Um, Jupyter Notebook could do lots of data things. Um, large memory, I talked about big memory uh, nodes, and I will talk about Docker later. And you know, there's uh, external network access to and from compute nodes, for example. I will talk about workflow management. Yeah, lots of things have been uh, talked about. And here is the production data software stack. Uh, we have data transfer um, tools, Globus, on, Globus Online, uh, No Machine, which is an MX. Um, there are some other, there's a Python, there's some, one of the APIs to, for you to access uh, without using the uh, web, but you could command line API as well. Uh, workflows, many of them, I only talk about Google Parallel, but the usage of, of, of all these are, doc, uh, you can find them on this documentations page. Uh, data management, HDF5, NCF, uh, um, higher level, uh, abstract level um, files. Uh, databases, MySQL, MongoDB, Progress, Postgres, SQL, um, lots of data analytics tools, Python, R, Spark, Julia, MATLAB, Mathematics, TensorFlow, PyTouch, PyTorch, Kara. <laughs> data visualization tools, visit Paraview. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. So I'm gonna talk about Globus Online, Science Gateways, uh, databases, not all of them, but um, not, just go um, to the slides. Globus Online, so just recommend one thing called Globus Online. You would, create an account, you log in to, with your NERSC um, um, credentials. And it's very good for you to move data to other NERSC centers, or you could even create your own, uh, it's called personal, connect personal. You could set up something on your laptop. Then when you log in to Globus, you can set up to transfer files from NERSC to your personal laptop to other DOE centers. To, when, when you do that, you basically, what you need to do is find an uh, uh, endpoint. So we have NERSC data transfer node endpoint. We have NERSC query endpoint, HPSS endpoint. You can have your own local laptop endpoint. So um, the good thing is that it um, automatically renews if there's an interruption. Uh, you get notifications, history logs, everything. So one example of uh, the uh, um, interface looks like is when you get in, you would choose uh, from here, you would choose available um, endpoints, uh, and then you choose another available endpoints, and then both files will show up um, on each side, and you would click a file, and you would do, you know, start from left to right, or you would do from right to left, and the files would just be uh, transferred for you. Of course, you need to log in. I didn't log in here for this one, just to show you. You would authenticate uh, on both sides, and that's, uh, especially good for larger uh, files because the Globus file and transfer is also highly tuned for the, this purpose. Um, you could still use uh, normal um, tools um, for smaller one-time transfers, but Globus still also works for small transfers as well. 
um, within the um, file system, we do have a, a simpler tool called give and take. So you give um, and provide a receiving user's username, a file, and the user will get an email and then he could, she could just do a take and from you, uh, the file name. That's also very convenient. For uh, sharing files to uh, external collaborators, when we have the web portals and science gateways. So web portals is, I mentioned that in each project has a directory called uh, in, in the community file system uh, uh, with your project name. From there, you would just create a directory called www and you could put all your HTML or whatever things you want to share. And this, um, the things in this directory will show up as HTTP portal.nus.gov CFS your project. So it's simpler. Um, if you have um, simpler needs, uh, you can use that. But if you're more sophisticated um, things, you want you know to collaborate, communicate with your users, and even allow them to you know download a subset or do even do some prop processing from within a web portal face. The thing we do is called Science Gateway, and they are um, made available called in a Spin service. So you can find some documentations there. You can attend a Spin workshop, and people. A nurse will help you to set those up for you. Uh, databases, I mentioned, we have um, relational and non-relational databases. If you have a need to set up a, a database, you could send in a request. Uh, shifter. Um, so what is Shifter? Shifter is basically a Docker-like functionality. Uh, if you hear of a Docker, what it does is it could package your um, whole setup, your OS, your uh, applications, uh, your tools um, within a package, and then you would upload to a Docker uh, registry. Then you can bring it, uh, download it, it's called pull, um, push and pull. You could pull it to another system and then you just use it uh, without worry about that other system, uh, system software, everything is not what you need. So you have basically your package, you can run it, um, and, and you can just run it saying something it's called within this container, right? So we would like to provide this for you, except uh, Docker needs, uh, when you package your Docker container, you need to be uh, an admin. So we couldn't let you do that on the query system, of course. So what we do is we uh, de develop something called Shifter. Um, it's a, it's a NERSC a custom Docker-like functionality. With that, what you do is, uh, let me show you this first. What you do is you would use a Docker file and you do something, you package whatever thing, and you could um, push this. So when you do that, a Docker build, you're doing it on your laptop. There you are the admin. You Docker build something and name it, and you could push it to the Docker uh, registry, or you could push it to a NERSC, uh, we call it shifter registry. So it's local to NERSC. So your, your image is not public to the world. Uh, it's your choice, either way it works. So, and then at runtime, you would um, do pull this image first. And then in your batch script, you add a few lines. You would add another line of as batch called dash dash image, your image name, and you would load this shifter. Then at runtime, you would, instead of running your application executable, you would put shifter as your uh, executable name, and then put your um, real ex executable name after that. So that's how you use uh, the shifter um, at NERSC. Uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, this is shifter um, allows you to get your own portable or, uh, package, your own, uh, own setup of your software. They also, um, I mentioned earlier for large, um, large size, large scale shared library usages um, for, for, for example, Python applications, almost everything library is um, dynamic. So loading a larger uh, Python job, it um, takes a lot of time. You sometimes, um, one of the uh, big user, actually his job was like using the four system configuration. It takes two hours to just load these libraries onto the um, compute nodes. So it's unbearable. So the way to do it is if you make a shifter image and the library is already, it's basically flattened out instead of the deeper, deeper trees of the Python library. So it's deepened out. And then you pour this image onto the compute node to run them. It now only takes about five minutes. Here, this example here is actually down from 500 seconds 
to about a hundred, uh, about a quarter of time to run this um, application, Python application. So, uh, so of course, shift is not just for Python, for anything, uh, larger jobs and dynamic, li dynamic libraries, your own um, software set uh, recommending to use shift. First buffer, as I mentioned, So the, the first buffer here is close to the compute nodes. Um, you could request a job temporary burst buffer just to this specific job. And um, so the storage, you will use those instead of luster file scratch file system to improve your IO performance. Or you could even request a longer called persistent reservation um, of your files onto this um, a portion of the burst buffer and it could be shared by multiple job of yours or uh, by others to use. So uh, in the batch script, it all looks like that, very similar to usual way, except you have a, a data warp a job DW burst buffer is a, uh, actually data warp is a special um, in implementation of uh, burst buffer technology. <laughs> um, so you would, uh, you ask how much uh, storage you need and the, type, whether it's scratch or whether it's persistent. Most of those you would use Stripe um, because there are multiple servers. You want the Stripe to get a better performance. And then we do a stage in and stage out. Uh, basically you have your lo local you know, scratch regular files and you need to uh, mount them onto the first buffer in, as a destination before your job runs. And stage out means after your job finishes, you want the, uh, the jobs in the um, on the burst buffer down back to the your local directory. So the usage is pretty simple as well. Um, now let me pause here a little bit. I'm going to talk about Python and Jupyter and did, um, deep learning, machine learning, and then we'll do hands on. So let me go back to the questions. Uh, this the normal questions. There's a question here in the chat. Oh, it's private. <laughs> so if, if it's private, I'll answer uh, to you in the hands-on session when I have some have time. If you want to make it public, then I'll answer um, in public. Uh, it's your choice. I think um, you know what I am talking to, <laughs> who I'm talking to. Okay, so because there's no uh, more question in the GDoc, I am going to go on to talk about Python for now. Okay, so Python. So Python becomes more and more popular uh, for the computing centers. So you come here, of course, you're not only doing um, serial job, you also want to do some parallel Pythons. And uh, Python in the, maybe 10 years ago wasn't uh, a choice uh, or be um, available on um, at centers like NERSC. Now we do fully support it. Uh, we use Anaconda Python that you have the choice to use our pre-built environment or to also install uh, your own environments um, with Conda install. So it's used in those, with the pre-built environments, regular things are uh, normally like NumPy, SciPy, Skidlearn. These are very commonly used. It's already part of our pre-built environments. Uh, for your own, if you want to you know something you, you get from, from GitHub, from your other application, you want to be part of the environment, you can uh, make your own. Um, I do not use any, the user being Python, comes with the OS uh, distribution. They are pretty old. So we do recommend you to use a module load Python. Um, then if you want to use um, own, what you do is module load Python and you kind of create a name with the Python base, uh, which we have, have is 3.7 and you source activate, um, then you would kind of install or pip install. After that, you uh, deactivate, source deactivate. Then you have a environment, my ENV, it's installed, it's available somewhere in your uh, dot slash, um, I don't exactly remember the location, but you can find it. The good thing is that if you don't like it and it takes up too much space, it becomes outdated, you can go to that directory and just delete it. 
or something goes too wrong, you want to just do a fresh rebuild, you can also start uh, delete the old one and start a new one. There are two ways to use this uh, your own uh, environment later. You could do source activate or counter activate. With source activate, it does not change uh, your dot files. Dot files are the initial uh, shell scripts that will be um, uh, invoked when you log in. Um, so if you do counter activate my env, what it does, it'll add a section to your dot files. Um, so either way, depends on your need, you can choose a source activate or counter activate. Some, sometimes when you counter activate, um, if some other things complications happen, you forgot there's actually this um, thing in your shell script might be interfering with your setup. So you might go there, you know, uncomment those things and uh, do some um, debugging. As I mentioned, people also want to run Python code in parallel. So there are a few options. Um, you could do a single node multi-processing if you get a, a, on a Jupyter and you get a, say for example, you get an exclusive node and you could um, run like implicitly using number of threads or num yeah, uh, for the Python um, in parallel, especially some of the libraries would call, would use uh, how many ever uh, threads available for, um, for them. This is something called Dask, uh, it's a framework It'll create a group of workers and then it'll coordinate your many tasks uh, from your um, application. It has also has very good visualization tools so you can um, manage the tasks and see how they're being running. It could run on a single node or many nodes. Um, there's also a package called MPI for PY, uh, MPI for Py. Um, so you could write Python and then um, within it, you could actually using multiple uh, MPI ranks. So the one thing is you do need MPI for Py inside your Conda environment. And um, what we said is do not Py pip store or Conda install because the complications to try to use the create and pitch inside instead of other MPIs you find. So follow the instruction to build um, uh, MPI for Py in then you can use it um, in your container if you want to do this in, in a container. Um, there's a Python scaling up documentation uh, with more information on those. Okay. So Jupyter, I think I showed Jupyter a little bit about this terminal uh, kernel, but um, Jupyter, you know, it's a we call also call it Jupyter Notebook. We you have access from we call Jupyter Hub uh, that Nurse provides. Jupyter Hub allows you to log in and allow multiple users to use um, it simultaneously. But what users usually do is in a notebook you could use different kernels, and in the in notebook you can be shared. You can publish things. People even use it for training tutorials, and with different um, kernels you can do data processing. You can do visualization. You could uh, do uh, machine learning, workflow, lots of things. Um, so uh, with Python, we already up to this, this uh, you know, can't install something, right? You, just like that. So if you want to use your own um, Kana environment in Jupyter uh, notebook, what you need to do is do one more step. Um, so you, first you need a, a Py, um, kind of install IPy kernel, which is a Python uh, Jupyter kernel. Uh, all the packages uh, beyond the default modules we have. With that, then you would do another step, my Py, uh, Python with M, my, uh, uh, with the um, M flag of the Py kernel, and then you would give it a name, my ENV Jupyter. Then when you launch the uh, Jupyter kernel, you would see your local, your custom setup of my EN Jupyter there. So I'll show you what I have. Um, so here is um, the counter install. You install some things easily. And once you install, um, um, yeah, so this one is very easy. You uh, um, just a few, a few packages and you get the name. What if you have uh, not only the packages, but you also want more setups? For example, I want my um, kernel to have a module loaded, uh, some module I use. I want to have some um, environment variables set. 
So what you do is you have can have more elaborative uh, called Jupyter Helper.sh, and you have anything you want in there, as long as you have the you know the same thing Python dash m ipy kernel at the end. Um, then um, very similar, you would give it a name. Then um, this environment, we called it my EME Jupyter 2 or appear as was more um, complicated settings. So uh, as in my example, I did both of them. So you can see, um, I can show you this slide first. So these are the available kernels. Once you actually um, logged into the website Jupyter kernels, you, would, you, you have a choice to select a kernel for your notebook. So you can see, you can see all these available, um, many of them are actually provided by NERSC, Python, Julia, um, you know, TensorFlow, many other PyTorch, right, these things. But you also see them, my EME Jupyter, my EME Jupyter 2, those are the my settings with the Kana install and my helper script stuff. Um, the other thing I think another person actually already asked, when I logged in, for example, I do not see my GPUs, my exclusive CPUs, that's right. Um, this is the user for two, for two actually. Um, I gave it a permission, give it access to the GPU. So now you see the GPU nodes. I give it access to the exclusive CPU. If you need more memory than a shared CPU node, you can um, also there's a request in the um, help folder. Otherwise, you mostly see the shared CPU node. Um, so, so you basically land onto a, another um, login node. So I said we have 12 login nodes, query 01 to query 12. The Jupyter nodes are like query 19, right? It's actually a logging node, but it's, uh, so people are sharing. So inside it, now you have a kernel, you could also, you know, um, interact with um, batch script. You could S batch um, a job to a batch script and monitor the job there. You could do all your uh, normal uh, Jupyter things, normal Python data analytics things inside Jupyter. So we already talked about this. And so I think last section um, before of the data analytics is um, deep learning, machine learning. And NERSC has provided all these uh, packages. Um, you could use it. So uh, a quick list here. Um, there's some um, <clears throat> survey we did. What frameworks tools are you using? So based on that, well, that's what we provide. Skip learn is part of a Python module. And then the Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, so we, that's why we're pro uh, providing those. And people, we also ask them, how do you use them? Do you use NERSC modules or do you use Conda uh, or use build from source? Uh, so the, the first two are the most popular choices. Uh, so you could use all these module load stuff and uh, you could, uh, <clears throat> on top of those to install more packages, Conda install, kind of hip install. And you could also uh, use uh, Jupyter Hub uh, notebook. We have prepackaged kernels, and you could also do more of the own custom kernels. So here is um, we ask where do you use them? Oh, the Jupyter elsewhere and Jupyter and NERSC as well. People um, use this at NERSC. Um, okay, so another a break point um, for questions. I'm looking down. So there's one more question. This may be a very specific question, but I was in Jupyter and tried to import Torch after doing pip install uh, in the terminal and it still says the module Torch is not present. Do you need a CUDA environment first or maybe I install in the wrong directory? Uh, I cannot answer this question. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether you're talking about query or query GPU because you're mentioning about CUDA environment. Uh, so in any case, um, I'm not expert on this. So I would suggest to you uh, create a NERSC supporting ticket, consulting ticket, and we will uh, direct to the person. Because uh, if I just show them this GDoc, they still looks like there's still a lots of back and forth here. So the most direct way is open a ticket and there'll be, um, you can email back and forth um, with that ticket for discussion. I think it's, it's more convenient. Okay, um, 
Let's get on just to show you a bunch of those online resources before we do the hands-on. So we have a classic Durst web webpage, and when I, it's www.nurse.gov. We have, you know, what science is there, and then uh, there's a, what news uh, publications, how to contact us. There's also from live status there, there's called uh, MOTD. So you could check whether the system's up or system down. Um, it's a pull down menu from live status. One thing I want to point uh, on this page, is, especially for users, is the training events page. Um, so the one we're having right now is uh, introduction to those resources. Um, next Friday, there's a crash course in supercomputing, uh, teach uh, users about MPI and OpenMP. So go to this page. If you're interested, please sign up. And the training account is um, applied for today. If you want to use it for next time, you don't have to reapply, just continue to use that. Um, we also have a NERSC channel, a YouTube channel called NERSC. If you search for it, um, the videos from the training events are there, even from some other events, not just training of NERSC. Um, um, that like NUG meetings, nurse user group meetings, some other data science uh, seminars, uh, deep learning for science schools. So you can find lots of videos um, of the nurse um, software and uh, applications uh, in the nurse YouTube channel. We also have a nurse user Slack channel and it's also linked there. And you, just, you need to log in to have the invitation for the Slack channel. Um, Okay, so this, this is the, we call it classic NERSC page. And then another page, online resource, it's NERSC documentation page, mostly the technical documentations. I didn't list them all. There are so many um, topics, um, programming, running applications, analytics, so lots of things there, and the performance. In the performance section, you'll find actually one page, if you are going to use Perlmutter, it will be of interest to you. There's a porting to Perlmutter guide. And then otherwise there's, uh, I forgot to list one thing. One of them is called systems. So uh, a button, um, a bullet systems, you in it, you can find Cori and then you find Perlmutter. And there's also the large memory node uh, in there as well. So from there, you could find all sorts of using the NERSC systems resources documentations. And one specific page I wanna mention is that um, actually at the very top, it's called getting started above all of these probably. So getting started pages is um, you know, just uh, geared towards new users. And we have different sections of things that we think of important to new users. We have the links to the slides and the most recent training videos in there um, as well. So check this out. Oh yeah, I forgot to read the other page. This is the page I wanted to show you. So I'm getting started pages here. I wanna actually emphasize it. Um, you know, the system pages here as well. Okay. So the next page is the IRIS page. IRIS page is basically account management and the reporting page. Uh, you go there, you find all your um, MFA settings, HSS keys, your project information, what users belong to, which project, what access, especially your QoS, you have access to like GPU or uh, Jupyter. You can also check your usage information down to each job level or the project level. Um, so this is the account management uh, page. And the help portal I've been mentioning to you is that http help.nose.gov, so you can submit um, tickets from there, um, you can even you can have access by default, and the tickets are open to a project, so you can see your other members in your project. Their tickets are um, there's some request forms. You can have a res no, compute node reservations. You can request um, database. You can request um, some other things I mentioned. Um, Code requests for example as well. There's a, a bunch of request forms right here. You can open a ticket and you can see all my ticket and my project ticket. So here are the interface. We use ServiceNow for um, the help portal. There's also a My NERSC page. Um, you also need to log in and has uh, some dashboard, you know, my usage, my activities, my jobs, some system status for the systems up and down. Um, these are things um, here you have um, you know, access to other things. So I just want to find more detail. You can see that this one actually 
uh, miners, please you to all other places. <laughs> because the dashboard here, you can see your data usage, query up, this is my jobs. And here, uh, service tickets, which is help down the stuff. Um, Jupyter Hub, you know, Jupyter down the stuff. Uh, nurse home page, which is classic page. Documentations portal is the documentations page. Accounts portal is the Iris uh, accounts page. So this page uh, do, does lead to uh, lead you to many other useful pages as well. So um, besides the uh, the um, general documentation docs.nurse.gov page, we also have docs-dev.nurse.gov dot gov page, which is more of the development systems. So Cori GPU is documented there. Uh, I believe some of uh, the students this summer will be using Cori GPU, if not Perlmutter. So this page will be very useful for you. The uh, usage compilers and, and uh, how to use GPU especially. So I wanna acknowledge here is I used uh, some slides materials from last year's and user training provided by lots of NERSC staff uh, in our multiple um, user, multiple uh, groups at NERSC here, how user engagement, application performance, data analytics, um, and JGI groups. So this is my content. So this next section will be hands-on. Um, let me go over any questions here again. Um, looks like no more questions besides that uh, last question we, I asked to open a ticket for. So right on time, uh, I say we do half an hour um, hands-on. Um, if we need more time, I do have reservations uh, set for longer. So let me, um, so people can stay and I'll be available um, for at least half an hour with that when we still have to know the reservation for. So what we have is I have the, uh, some materials in the Scratch directory. So you need to log in to Cori, right? Um, if you have MFA set up, you can log in. If you, if you do not, uh, um, with the, the training accounts do not need MFA. So with the account uh, name and password, you should be able to log in to Cori. Just type SSH space, uh, your login name space, Cori.nursk.gov. I should put it up here. Um, then you would um, see to your own local Scratch directory because we want you to run anything from Scratch. Then you would copy um, this directory to your local uh, Scratch. Notice there's a dot at the end, uh, meaning you would copy over it with the same file name, same directory name. So don't forget this dot. And then you CD to your uh, uh, CSS directly under there, and there are a few um, readme files. Uh, the hello world is an exercise, matrix is just an example, and XTHI is as another, ex uh, another exercise. So hello world is a, just a very basic, um, you can do sequential uh, hello world or um, parallel hello world from one, sequential is just uh, one process, or uh, if it's um, parallel hello world, or we have multiple MPI ranks to say, hello, I'm rank zero from of total of eight. Hello, I'm rank five of eight, et cetera. So the readme files about how to compile for the run, what other things you could you know, change for, do some, um, uh, some um, tests. A matrix example to show you here, I, this is an example I can actually generate uh, real, uh, computation results as a matrix um, computation and you should see uh, the final output. And I show some examples of how to compile that one and how to run it um, as well. The more advanced one or more uh, kind of um, hard to understand one is called XT high. The source code is provided by HPE. It's called X it, when we had the Cori system as a well, um, even before when we had the uh, XT system, Cori is an XC system, whatever. So it's called XT system and high. And this is a, my, a hybrid MPI and OpenMP code. You have multiple OpenMP threads per MPI task. And when you run with multiple MPI ranks, uh, it reports say, hi, I'm rank, uh, I am thread five of rank two, and, and I am running on which cores. The cores it reports on is the CPU numbers. 
That's why I uh, mentioned about maybe you should uh, uh, the, the diagrams of house one canal, the numbers um, you could you know compare with. <clears throat> so the the and then you could ex, um, experiment with removing those dash C and dash CPU bind to see how they map ma, uh, map bind differently. So we have the running jobs pages um, references here. Um, for the reservation, so from now from twelve. Uh, from now to um, 3.30 Pacific time, we have the reservations. Um, so to, to use the reservations, you would add something in your batch script. It's, it's part, it, I did write those down in the readme file. So basically uh, the dash dash reservation equals XXX and dash A, Y, Y, Y. So XX is mean you have to provide a reservation name so I have some nodes reserved on Haswell nodes. The name is called intro Haswell. And some KNL nodes also reserved. So the name is intro KNL, depending on which one you want to uh, try to target for. And the uh, YYY are the um, account name, project name. So if you're an existing user, um, we ask for your username in the registration form. So you may belong to another project but I have added you to this project called an intern because uh, for a making, when I made the reservation, we cannot put everybody's uh, different account. So you're in an intern um, reservation, then you just say dash type capital N and intern and you can access the reservation. Uh, if you're a train account user, just put dash capital A and train. So both of these projects can access this reservation. And after the, today's class, after 3.30, um, reservation will be gone. Just don't worry about these uh, flags and you can just run the batch scripts or as batch or as alloc without those. Okay, so this is uh, my talk. So let's, people can do your exercises and um, just uh, ask any question in the chat and I can monitor chat, especially if you have account issues or any question related to any of these exercises, let me know. I'll be here for another hour. And people are free to leave uh, maybe after three. I, I do hope you stay um, if you haven't run a job on Curry. So it's a great chance to try it now. Thank you very much. So I see um, some questions here. How do we log into Cori? So is, this person said, I tried to log into Cori using the username and password to get a log into Iris with, but I get authentication failures. Do I, did I need to set up a different nurse account that I can use to log into Iris? Uh, Iris does show me in an intern account. So if you have not, if you are in an intern account, it means um, you have provided your NOSC login name. Um, so you're using your regular NOSC login name instead of a train account, training account. For that, um, if for that account to be able to log into Curry, you need to set up MFA. Um, otherwise, uh, you cannot log into it. Um, I think I. I think it's, um, you probably want to do that at another time. So temporary, I think what I can do is I can um, go to Iris and make you opt out of uh, the MFA. So you can um, uh, private chat me in Zoom and I'll go to Iris to, to allow you to log into Curry with just your password. Just, uh, I'll give you, um, a day to set it up. So right now you can do the um, real exercise. So another uh, question, I saw that several text editors are supported, but I'm not sure how to open and use them. We have VI, we have Emac, we have Vim. Hmm. My person, I'm personally a VI user, but um, so, uh, 
Maybe you can edit uh, on your local system and just um, move it over. At the least, if you don't can't do more of the text editing things, um, you can do the copy the directory over and just do the s batch or s alloc. You can do the s alloc following. Um, if you cannot um, do the vi or anything, you can on the um, Corey's login node, you could do more in this space, the readme file. So you have that in front of you and then open another terminal. Um, you can just open up the S alloc session with the reservation. And then in there, you can just type without need, uh, the need of editing any of the files. Um, another question is when I try this command on copy, blah, blah, I got this error, missing destination file or print. Copy uh, Yeah, so I see this error with the dot and the CSSS and a dot, uh, put a space in between. So that means copy the first directory and then that second, the dot and the space and the dot, that dot means use the same file name or directory name. Yeah. Did I, my example could, forgot to do this dot, the space? Let me see. I think I should have a space. There's a space, it's not clear, but there's a space, okay. Um, the other presentation slides up, I'm trying to access slide 94 with the first set of, yeah, here, slide 94, I'm now I'm posting it on the screen. Okay, I know there's another question here about here. Did I ask, answer all the questions? At this point, if you want to unmute yourself, you can as well. Just talk to me. How do we assist into query from terminal? Um, yeah, I should type that. Um, so it's SSH L your username query.news.gov. What did I do? Type. So this is h dash l username call dot nusk. This this dash is little l. It's not clear in the zoom, but it's not i or anything. It's just little l. Um, you could also do sometimes I do um, sh username at coin.gov. And if your username is the same as um, on your laptop or local machine, you can just do ssh query.nose.gov without specifying username. I think I've answered all the questions. If not, um, if not, I have not answered your question. You can you highlight this in Blue Dog in case I did miss it. I think I answered all. Okay. Uh, follow up. I saw several text editors. I'm not sure how to open and use them. And I uh, have how uh, there's a connection, connect MFA. How can I use a tool that requires authentication to a NERSC host? Where, this is where I use, I read that you can use BB edit. Oh, I haven't used BB edit. I understand how it works. So one thing I suggest um, not for today is the, the Globus um, tool. Um, so I have set up a personal it's called personal endpoint. With that, it becomes really convenient um, here. Once you set this up, so, so you log in to globus.org and, and where you will find Globus Connect Personal and you would name your uh, personal laptop as a um, endpoint. So now in this next, um, and I should oh, close my, now in this, um, 
the transfer API thing uh, on the web, you could um, on one side choose your laptop, on the other side choose NERSC. Okay. 